Boston, Saturday, June 27. Cold Hard Steel meets I Did Rivalry. John Cena builds Rusev for the United States Championship in a steel cage match. Plus, Seth Rollins collides with Roman Reigns for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. It's WWE Super Show, Saturday, June 27. Tickets and VIP packages available this Saturday. You already know Kowloon Restaurant, established in 1950 and spanning four generations, serves a multi-Asian menu. Did you also know that Kowloon Restaurant is New England's premier Asian dining and entertainment complex, serving Cantonese, Szechuan, Thai, and Polynesian cuisine? And did you know that Kowloon Restaurant is also the home of the finest Japanese sushi? If you haven't dined at Kowloon Restaurant lately, then you simply haven't dined at Kowloon. Kowloon Restaurant, Route 1 North in Saugus. This is Shelton Benjamin. This is Harley Race. This is Mick Foley. This is Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. This is the Monster of Business. This is Daniel Bryan. This is JBL, and you're watching the MWF. Be there live. Good evening, everyone. Um, unfortunately, Bill Eady, Demolition Axe, was not able to make it tonight. Uh, so how this is going to go is I'm going to speak about Bill. Jimmy's going to speak about Barry. And then uh, Dakota's going to speak about Barry. Uh, Bill Eady was trained in the early 1970s by Ghetto, who was Mongolian, uh, along with uh, he was actually Nikolai Volkov's partner. Uh, Bill trained with Ron Matusik and Larry Zabisco, who was just inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame. <laughs> Bill's first trip to Japan was in the mid-70s as a mass superstar. He made a good, good impression on Antonio Noki. During the flight over to Japan, Ghetto kept telling Bill not to take any shit from all the Japanese guys. They were on a flight for 17 hours, so by the time Bill gets off the plane, he's ready to kill somebody. The, uh, the one show in Japan, Anoki wound up wrestling Bill. They're in the ring. Anoki slaps Bill before they even lock up. And that's a sign of disrespect. So Bill, not really knowing, just hauled off and popped Anoki in the nose. Out through the ropes he went, and there he's laying on the ground. And it was at that point that Bill was like, great, I just punched the boss, and he's laying on the floor. I'm fired. After a few beers, everything was smoothed over. Bill wound up uh, making over 42 trips to Japan as a mass superstar, and then eventually as um, one of the machines. After coming back to the States, he worked for many different territories, 
like Mid Atlantic, the NWA uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling, the AWA, the WWWF, and also the WWF. He wrestled Andre the Giant in Greenwood, South Carolina, which is actually was very close to Andre's home. Now, Bill has never met Andre before, and they were in separate dressing rooms, so they get into the ring, and Andre tells the referee, tell him to come in for a scoop, scoop slam. Well, because Andre lived so close, he had tipped a few back. So as, as Andre goes to pick up Bill, he starts to stumble. Bill puts his hands on Andre's head so that Andre can press him up over and the only thing Andre says is, thanks boss. <laughs> so, um, Bill's in, Bill has been in the industry for 35 plus years. He actually still takes bookings, but not for much longer. He's been married for 44 years to his lovely wife Sue. He always talks about his grandson Christopher his two daughters, Heather and Julie, and his other grandkids. For those of you that don't know, Bill and Barry were a workhorse for Vince during those days when they were in demolition. And a case in, an example of that, when they'd be in Chicago, Hogan and Orndorff would wrestle just before intermission. They would hop in a car straight to the airport, they would fly from O'Hare to Denver to main event in Denver, and Bill and Barry were the main event in Chicago. And by the time they finished with the main event, got to their hotel, it was about one o'clock, and then they had to be up at five to get on a flight by seven. So for all those years that they were in the WWF, they were the workhorses. And with that, I'll send over to Jimmy, please. Thanks, Trevor. Um, as I said here tonight, you know, leading up to this, it's been about three months that I've known that I had to present for demolition. And thanks for ever asking me enough to come up with a speech. But to be in front of all the people that I grew up watching, it's a good feeling. It's the people that I helped train, they're out here. But as the video package, and it was well done, um, that played my speech fell apart because all the statistics that were in the package was my speech. So as I thought about things, you know, this is the ring of friendship. And back in the AWF, it was 96 or 97, it's the first time I met Barry Darso. And he treated me like gold. I was a punk kid, took me underneath his wing, made me feel at home. About six or seven years ago, Bill Eadie, did the same thing the first time I met him at GLCW up in Wisconsin. I've had the honor to work with both of these men numerous times, bring them into Powell Entertainment, which is my fed, and every time that I see them, it's not action smash. It is building merit. They're genuine people. It's all about friendship. We talk about a ring of friendship here at CAC. That's a huge friendship and a brotherhood. Wrestling is brotherhood, and if you want to know my opinion of brotherhood, that's Barry Darso and Bill Eadie, who truly are genuine people. With that, I'm not going to speak anymore, but I'd like to bring Dakota Darso up to the stage. Uh, I just want to start off by saying throughout being in this business, I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of people performers, fans, everybody that you can think of. And I've had a lot of those people tell me what a privilege it is to know my dad and uh, tell me how he has somehow influenced their career or made some sort of impact on his life. And I just want to say he hasn't influenced anybody else more than me. <laughs> he uh, not only influenced my career, but he's influenced every aspect of my life. You know, from the time I was a little kid and I would say, Dad, I'm going to play in the NHL someday. He said, okay, son. And he sent me to every hockey camp that you think of, went to every arena when he was home. And then uh, one day I said, Dad, I'm going to play football in college. And he said, okay, son. And he drove me all around the state of Minnesota to every college that you can think of so I could see everything, meet every coach. A couple years after that, I said, hey, Dad, 
I'm gonna drop out of college and I'm gonna become a pro wrestler. He said, okay, okay, you can do that. And he brought me to every independent show that he ever went on and would throw me around in the ring and he'd sit and watch all kinds of tapes with me and say, all right, you need to try to do that. Let's try to do this. And really helped me to try to hone my craft. Uh, the day that I decided that I was gonna to propose to my wife, I called him up and he talked me through it all. I was so nervous. Felt like I was headlining WrestleMania that day. And, uh, you know, he was the best man at my wedding. And then uh, two years ago, I said to him, in the midst of our time in society when most of the country hates the police, I said, hey, Dad, guess what? I'm going to go to the police academy. Yeah. And he said to me, he goes, son, you're married. You have two beautiful children. You're a professional wrestler for 10 years. If that shit has a kilt in it, it will be a cop. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, he called me up a few months ago and he told me that he was going to be here this weekend. And I don't get to see him very often. He asked me if I would come up here and introduce him and Bill. And Bill was like an uncle to me growing up when I was a little kid, I remember running around in the locker room, painting my face like my dad, and hanging out with Daddy and Uncle Bill. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's a pleasure for me to be here to introduce them. Um, so that being said, I want to I welcome up my, my mentor, my hero, my best friend, my father, Barry Darso.
So that's that's my partner, Bill Eady. That's uh, why everything was so good when he was my partner. He did the talking. I kind of finished up the promos. I begged him to get out of the ring. He wouldn't get out of the ring, so I just got in there my couple of minutes, and uh, we had a great time. And in order to be a great tag team, you had to go against good tag teams. And we went against the best tag teams and had the time of our lives. And I'll tell you, growing up, I, uh, I used to watch Larry Hennig, Harley Race, Nick Bockwinkle, uh, Bobby Heenan, and I always wanted to be a wrestler. But I, I thought, how am I gonna be a wrestler? Well, when I was like 20 years old, I worked at a bar in Northeast Minneapolis, and Rick Rude, Mike Hagstrand, and Joel Laranitis, we all worked at the bar together. And Eddie Sharkey was a bartender at the bar, and one night uh, we were sitting at the bar after we were all closed, and he says, you guys need to get into pro wrestling. And right away we all looked at each other and said, let's do it. So Eddie Sharkey, he uh, rented a church basement. We wrestled in a boxing ring. We beat each other up for almost a year. It was brutal. And Eddie Sharkey never smartened us up. So when we hit each other, we really hit each other. <laughs> so now everybody started going out on the road, going their different ways. And I was uh, uh, called to go to Honolulu, Hawaii, and work for Mrs. Maivia. Oh, I love Mrs. Maivia, by the way. Uh, I didn't have any wrestling things. So I called Kurt Hennig up. I said, Kurt, I said, you've got to bail me out. I said, I need some wrestling things. He says, hey, I'll meet you at the gym tonight. I'll bring you some wrestling things. So he comes to the gym. I put them on. They fit just perfect. I go to Hawaii, wrestle in Hawaii, wrestle all over the South Pacific, um, get down. Um, now I'm down kind of by Charlotte wrestling for Crockett. And, uh, we were wrestling a town up uh, by Baltimore, and I seen that Kurt was on the card. So I called Kurt, I said, hey Kurt, let's go to a bar tonight after, I haven't seen you in a couple of years. He says, yeah, Barry, he says, I'm gonna be there, but do um, um, you still have those wrestling tights I gave you? I said, yeah, why? He says, well, don't wear those here. And he says, and my dad's gonna be coming. Whatever you do, try to avoid him. And I'm thinking, why, why would I want to, you know, he's, He's one of my heroes, literally the next day. And uh, Chris says, yeah, uh, those were his favorite trunks. <laughs> and I said, his favorite trunks? What do you mean? He says, he was so upset that he was missing his trunks, I told him you were at the house and you stole them out of the top drawer. <laughs> that was Kurt Hennig. I love Kurt Hennig, but, but Larry, I do still have your trunks, I washed them, and if you need them back, I can get them back. But anyways, um, I am really, really honored, like Bill said, to be up here. This is just an incredible, incredible organization. I uh, have to thank Brian Blair. He, uh, we were in Niagara Falls, and he says, Barry, you gotta come on to Cauliflower Rally. I looked up on the website, I bought a lifetime membership, and I'm here, and I love it, and thank you.